And we are good. OK, so I have to tell you like what made me want to do this in sure. the first place. Uh, I was watching Fright Night. Fright Night. Yes, the original Fright Night. And after thirsting after, after uh, Chris Sarandon <laughs> for, for the for the vast majority of time, uh -huh. it suddenly dawned on me that he had a um, like a Hollywood insinuated live in boyfriend while also going after like a younger, more attractive woman. Ah. And he, his, his partner was fine with it. Oh, I am so interested in that. That is <laughs> fascinating. So I, I couldn't stop thinking about that. And um, I knew that, you know, I wanted to do another show with you. And when I was like, uh -huh. who, who wants to talk with me about this? I was like, Parker. Parker wants yeah. to talk with me about this. <laughs> Hell um, yeah. So, hey, everybody. I am Sam, and welcome to Happy Ever After Party. And with me again is the one and only Parker Gibson. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all again, hear you all again, have you hear me all again. You know, insert random words here. <laughs> I know. Uh, so this this episode is really kind of – oh, I need to get my coffee again. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by the letter K. Oh. <laughs> it is, after all, coffee, the only fuel that's denoted for keeping us alive during podcasting. Oh, my God. You you cannot be more right. Um, so this this episode is going to be interesting because there is a lot of discussion about um, queer coding villains in pop mm -hmm. culture, especially with like right. fairy tales and fantasy. But mm -hmm. it, it only barely gets mentioned about kink and polyamorous culture also mm -hmm. getting coded into villainy over time. And admittedly, mm -hmm. it's all sort of like interrelated, but I kind of wanted to focus specifically on the kink and poly aspect of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to talk with you about it because this is something that both kind of like fascinates us and, mm -hmm. um, we're both movie junkies and stuff. And Absolutely. Uh, when doing research for this, you came up with like a lot of interesting, like much more source material than I thought we were going to be listening to. Because initially I thought we were just going to be talking about the movies and how like Hollywood did all this. But no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, this, this goes back to like the 14 and 1600s. So if we could actually – I know we had talked a couple of things about uh, uh, like fairy tales and such that I brought up, but I wanted to bring – I wanted to kind of start things off with mm -hmm. a very different sort of take on Bluebeard. Oh, okay. So I, well, I, I wanted to jump in. With, yeah, yeah. As in, so we're starting off with that one, and then we're going to jump into the others if that's okay. Yeah, uh, no, this is th this is new territory for me. So, folks, this this is a fresh so, reaction. So, let's talk about let's talk about Bluebeard for a moment, right? Yeah. Uh, I actually believe it or not, I brought this up. This is the thing I brought up in therapy and discussed with my therapist about, and she and she had an interesting take on it too. Okay. So, so if we look at Bluebeard, who is a on the surface a serial killer and a yes. serial monogamist. Okay. However. Let's let's dig a little deeper, because after all, any kind of research into into non-standard things involves a certain amount of bias on on the part of the researcher. So I'm coming into this with a hypothesis and okay. my hypo and my hypothesis is that Bluebeard actually wanted to be poly. OK, but yet didn't have the tools to behave in a poly way so therefore he succumbed to societal pressures and in turn just basically killed off one relationship in order to have another because he didn't have the tools necessary to comprehend that what he wanted 
were multiple partners who all brought different things to his life. Hmm. I mean, like, so part of it is I, I can already, I, I'm trying to figure out if that was a hmm of intrigue or hmm of disappointment. Hmm. It's so, not a disappointment. It's you, you have a very interesting inference and I'm trying to figure out what your premises were. So if we, if we think about it, this, the, the part that I discussed with my therapist was that this, this idea of Bluebeard basically, in essence, killing off his partners is maybe not literal, but perhaps metaphorical or even, I suppose we could say allegorical, because what he's doing is he is he's going through the psychological process of ending one relationship to have another. And, okay. and he's doing that by setting up this sort of test, right? The whole point of Bluebeard is the test. You can't go into that room. You go into the room, I'm going to kill you. Or, you know, if you go into the room, something's going to happen. Okay. So he sets up a boundary and he's, and, but he sets it up in such a way that whoever's being presented with that boundary is going to fail, right? He basically has all these breadcrumbs like, oh, don't go in there. Don't go in there. No, 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 no. You can't go in there. If you go in there, bad things. No, 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 no. But here you really want to go in there. So he basically, he, he sets up his partners to and then when he then when they inevitably fail and he's like, aha, I was proved right. You cannot you cannot possibly stop yourself from bypassing this boundary. Therefore, to hell with you. So, I mean, it, it sort of represents this idea that he's he's dooming people to fail, almost searching for this impossible ideal of someone who can uh, who can avoid that boundary. And if he had just been more honest with himself and if he had just been more uh upfront and forward with setting up his boundaries then i feel like that he could have in fact had what he really wanted all along which were different partners for different needs in his life so uh, two things kind of come to my mind and that is did the language exist back then for him to actually communicate that desire and also can the same be said about henry the eighth that is a hell of a connection. And as for the language existing back then, uh, we have, and this is part of some other research that I did that we didn't really talk about. Uh, like, let's talk about harems. Yeah. Well, that so, that was almost purely that that had no amour in the polyamory. That that was all functional. That was all. You need to make sure that you inherit an heir. So we well, are giving you the tools, i.e. uteri, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I actually I did a little bit of research on harems. Like keep in mind this is like Wikipedia research, so it's really not research. It's just kind of it's the bare minimum. Bit. Right. So interestingly enough, come to find out that the majority of harems were actually monogamous. The average number of like in the late Ottoman Istanbul, as referenced mm. by the Wikipedia article on harems, only 2.29 percent of married men were polygamous. That makes sense. Um, uh, there was actually a really good video I saw recently that sort of discussed um, the West's perception of what a harem was mm -hmm. and like how it was like so blown out of proportion, but it was actually like kind of boring <laughs> and it, it wasn't it wasn't nearly as um as scandalous as uh some people made it out to be but it was sort of like you, you know maybe it was like the partners of blackbeard or uh, bluebeard a little bit where mm -hmm. it was like no you can't go into that room you are not allowed in there and then you're like well what the hell is in there that that i can't possibly have and it's you know, a very big sign that says you lost the game. Yeah, more or less. Sorry. <laughs> Apo my sincerest apologies to the audience. No, 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 no. I, I did that on purpose because the audience has to come down with me. So, uh, damn it. I know. It's, that's my job. So, this, I mean, I, I really, when I was doing that research on harems, I was really kind of fascinated to find out that the, that clearly the Western, uh, the Western presentation of it was blown out of proportion by those. And please forgive the term Orientalists because that that accurately That's describes. The word. Yeah, those are the people that were fascinated with Eastern culture and uh, use that term 
uh, to describe uh, themselves as well as use that term to basically describe everything that was in the near and far east, at least yeah. in reference to Britain. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just this like lewd and lascivious sort of presentation and like a, a variety of women lounging about and scandalous poses. It's almost a quote from the article, I think, just like kind of like laying around and like lusting after some singular person. But in fact, it was a hell of a lot more functional. It was yeah. it was more about seclusion of women than it ever really was about dudes getting booty. Yeah, like it, it, it kind of, it, 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 to a certain extent, like, has ruined so much of our interactions with the East, mm -hmm. um, especially like pre Islam. Yes. Relations. And um, that actually has a major influence on post Islam relations. Uh, to the point where, uh, you know, like the art that depicts harems, mm -hmm. um, that as of a few years ago was used as propaganda against Syrian refugees. Not surprising at all. Yeah. So it's like the the damage is done and like it's not just like, oh, oopsies. There was a mistake that happened many, many years ago, but we could just sort of brush it aside. And it's like, no, no, the, these are things that we kind of have to like reevaluate and still discuss, um, which is another reason why I kind of wanted to bring this up is like mm -hmm. the the whole idea of. Um, well, I, I won't even just say polyamory, but like any non monogamous non-functional sexual relationship being mm -hmm. portrayed as villainous um that that's used to sort of like denote so many other like social cues of what is and isn't acceptable including queer okay. culture mm -hmm. but uh like well, one of the things that pops into my mind too this has nothing to do with fantasy or fairy tales uh yeah. but barbarella Oh God, what a film. <laughs> I know that's that, that may have been one of the most uh, crucial films in my development. It, it made me the person that I am today. Uh, you know, random side <laughs> note for me, for me, one of the most crucial developmental things was reading Fanny Hill as a young child. Say no more. See? Yes. Wah, wah. And I, I, <laughs> I, I would certainly I, I I would definitely will say that you have you have climbed that hill. <laughs> you, you sure have. Yeah. Um, it insert snappity bump bump but um Yeah. <laughs> That's that was my one joke. That was my one joke for this episode. I'm hey, you're allowed I'm a, one. I'm a barely functioning host this time around but i i must get up the energy for a fanny joke and, and it was it was fundamental fun demental i not only that but i'm more going with the with the more uh uh definite definition of fundament referring to one's posterior oh my god see i give up that's my you job you know it that's okay. We we did this for like just under 15 minutes. I'm just going to stop here. I understand we're, completely. We're, we're done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, get, get, getting back to Barbarella and yeah. why I bring this up in the like in the context of this sort of very similar to uh, Chris Sarandon. Mm -hmm. The. Um, the the woman who captured Duran Duran, and I'm trying to remember her name. I can't remember her name, but like the the evil ruler of the planet that that Barbarella has to to rescue Duran Duran from, uh -huh. uh, she she is painted as an obvious bisexual, a very okay. villainous bisexual. Uh, 
you know, but but she shows like a very strong affection and uh, will to dominate both men and women, you know, always uh-huh. referring to all of them as, you know, my pretty, pretty. <laughs> and, you know, like in, in, in the end, she gets to fly away with um, the the cool, blind angel dude and Barbarella. So it's yeah. sort of like. Like the villain kind of won. You know, <laughs> in that yeah. one. That one instance, and it's like, oh, the bisexuals got to live this time around. And, like, there's so many instances of non-monogamy being used to codify not just villainy, but the um, unfaithful nature of bisexuals or closeted gays. Interesting. That... And a lot of it kind of sort of stems from, like, the fairy tale and fantasy adaptations. Like, a lot of that, like, a lot of those tropes are a lot of that, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not resentment, but like that, um. Is it, is it like jealousy in a way? (sighs) No, not jealousy, but it's like, um. Like, if you're watching Barbarella, okay? Yeah. And, like, you see the evil ruler kind of lusting after everybody. And you watch a play or a movie like Rent. Okay. Where the bisexual character's biggest flaw is her infidelity. Mm. you know okay like yeah a lot of like a lot of those tropes from fantasy end up bleeding out into like other sort of like drama and categories and stuff like that and the same thing can kind of be said about kink mm. so so we're talking about in essence the uh the assignation of negative stereotypes to an alternative behavior uh, as a way of, like we've talked about, like the, the kind of whole point of this is like villain coding, and, yes. and and saying that this is something that not normal people do, and if you're not normal, then you're bad, therefore you're a bad person. Yeah, and like like I said before, there are so many good videos out there about uh, queer coding villains that mm-hmm. I highly recommend watching those. But I specifically wanted to talk about like the kink aspect of it and the non-monogamy part because that it's all interrelated Hmm. by the way is the is the name of the villain the black queen i think so because she does wear all Mm -hmm. black yeah so once again all wear all black you know black is a villainous color what colors do we often what colors do we often see in in uh, kink clothing that are portrayed in mass media, they're black, they're form fitting, they're usually and she shiny. Has a whip. She They've whips got, people. She's got a whip. Yeah. So, so torture equals yeah. villainous behavior. Torture tied to kink. Kink equals bad. Torture equals bad. Bad, bad. You know, the far bush, a wall, after bush, no wall, place in history, secure. I mean, just like this whole kind of bullshit of that's bad, it's bad, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I I think it's kind of interesting because if we're if we're going off of how they portray like villainous femmes, like mm-hmm. they definitely play up like the kink aspect of it. Sure. But when it, them up a little. Yeah, like de- de- definitely make them doms and mm-hmm. um see the evil queen that Disney came up with and definitely see Maleficent. Sure. All forms of her except for the once upon a time version i actually really was upset that they did not kink her up uh <laughs> but there everything that once upon a time did to maleficent was just downright dirty so we're not going to talk <laughs> about that here once upon a time is not real i'm not with amanda i am with you i am safe um but you're in your safe space we're talking about poly and kink this is safe yes. this is not once upon <laughs> no nightmares <laughs> Rumpelstiltskin is my safe word. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
but but kind of like differentiating like the villainous femmes versus the the villainous masks like using non-monogamy and kink they're yeah. they're represented in two very different ways where like yeah. they're both usually domineering but mm-hmm. with like the women it, it it ends up being like they dress very fetishy and yeah like almost all the time they have whips or certain gear um mm-hmm. There is one exception to all of this, but I'm I'm gonna hold on to it. and I'll bring it up later. Uh, I do have another question men, for you. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, um, gonna... no, go, go ahead, please. Okay, with the men though, it's almost all about what I I know that you did a lot of research on is like the like the gentle dom that's mm-hmm. submissive, like um subliminally threatening. Mm-hmm. And it usually ends up being like age play or like daddy daughter kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So that you don't really see that with like villainous, non monogamous, kinky women, but you absolutely do with men. Yeah. That's actually that, that what that does is that leads me into a question. Can we say that uh, basically? dominating femmes in in culture where they're kind of like being portrayed as kinky and hardcore they also seem to share many traits that are normally coded masculine yes um i i would say that that's fair um and what it usually is is like if the black queen for example was doing all that stuff but mm-hmm. was a man. If it was the Black King, uh, mm-hmm. he w- more than likely knowing this, knowing Barbarella, he'd be like hot and shirtless and sure be nothing but guy liner. But mm-hmm. I don't think he would be. He wouldn't be sexualized quite as much. Right. You know? He would be mas- He would be masculine, and he would be presented as a as a more stereotypical strong leader. Uh, yeah. Like, like my, again, my sort of hypothesis is on this. If we want to make a, if you want to make a woman a villain, or a, a femme presenting person a villain, mm-hmm. we we assign that character masculine traits. Yes. We make them domineering. We make them bossy. We make them a bit like I'm. I'm even using words that are, nor that normally have negative connotations because if those same traits were being presented by a masculine presenting person then mm-hmm. they would be seen as positive they would be seen as positive examples of how to be appropriately masculine but when you but when you throw those on to a femme presenting character then all of a sudden now they're negative negative. and here's the thing if it was a man all of those can be portrayed as a negative it's just a lot of other things go into play when it's a villainous woman how they mm-hmm. dress how they talk the kind of innuendos that they use for people. Um, yeah. They kind of, like, and especially, like, in Barbarella, there's this, um, the way that she looks at Barbarella is the male gaze. But it's very obvious that the male gaze is coming from her. Mm. So, again, that's sort of like queer coding a villain. Mm-hmm. But it's also under this kind of context of, like, domination and submission. So yeah. there's there's like a lot of layers that go into using all of those masculine traits as a negative mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. they're coming from a woman versus like a very domineering like leader like mm-hmm. um ooh ooh um <sighs> going back to Fright Night mm-hmm. it's that movie is interesting because that is not using the male gaze okay if anything it is using a not even quite a female gaze but just like a very neutral gaze okay. like when chris sarandon is shirtless and when he <laughs> is seducing people and like the inappropriateness of him going after a high school girl i'm going to leave that for something else we we like we're maybe going, like maybe when we discuss labyrinth when we discuss labyrinth we, we will get to that but for the purpose of this conversation like mm-hmm. it's not seen as being overtly sexual towards the woman it's being yeah. overtly sexual towards him 
like he he's sort of like surrendering himself to the camera and to the audience so Hmm. and again he has a live-in male partner Uh and he's shown to be very sexually aggressive towards people you don't you you see him kind of like hug the guy from behind at one point Mm -hmm. and like kind of like caress him but it doesn't get any more overt than that it's all insinuated (laughs) you know like but that's sort of like how a villainous man is portrayed like it's not just that you're being giving feminine traits it's that you are very much domineering and aggressive Mm -hmm. but the charm is what seduces people and you are misleading them and that's what i think kind of gives way into a lot of like the daddy daughter play Uh it's the fact that you come off so darn charming but actually you're a dick so let's let's kind of bring this all back to bluebeard for a second before we go off in another direction Mm -hmm. and so if we so if we take everything we just talked about, right? We take yeah. all these different the discussion of harems and the discussion of of multiple partners. Do we like what do we think about Bluebeard? Do you think Bluebeard was a person who really wanted to be Polly but but didn't have the tools to be Polly? Do we think he was just a serial murderer whether it was in whether it was literally or figuratively when it comes to relationships or uh, is he somewhere in between? I would say that using your hypothesis, I don't even see it as like one or the other. I just sort of view the, the inability to process your desires for having multiple partners may have been one of many, many things that led him to be such a, uh, cold and ruthless serial killer such a douche canoe yes it's like um in silence of the lambs Uh uh-huh uh hannibal lecter has this line that a lot of people look over when uh when he's talking about bill and um sterling asks him about um him him being trans Mm -hmm. and Lecter says that's not really the case you know he is somebody who just wants to very desperately be another person and it kind Mm. of doesn't matter who he is so his, his actual desire is not to be a woman his desire is to literally be somebody else and it doesn't matter who and to just be anyone other how, than himself yes and this is kind of how it's manifesting uh-huh. so it's not like like how many people kind of interpret it as like oh like he's just another crazy trans person it's like no he's not trans Like, that's not the issue. It's just sort of how it's manifesting. Mm. And I feel like you could, if you're, if what you're talking about could be applied to Bluebeard, I almost Uh feel like that's the case too. Like, where that is just one thing going on in a very, very, very disturbed person's life. I really legit fucking love that that is really really cool Mm -hmm. and i love and i love that thought process that you just brought up about here's that that's someone that is so desperate to not be themselves that they're willing to be anybody else yeah and And it's just a shame that that gets overlooked (laughs) God, that's and I, so good. And I've I've missed it, honestly. Like it took me until this year to remember that 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 was discussed. Like that God, that was so perfect. good. Yeah. Oh, damn. Now I gotta go find that. That's really tasty. It's on Netflix. Yeah, I gotta watch that again. I yeah. have a so that <laughs> legit leads me into a different path. If you don't mind. Moving on from Bluebeard, moving on from Hannibal Lecter. Can we talk about Little Red Riding Hood for a second? Please. So let's talk about the traditional 
the, uh, Little Red Riding Hood for just a moment. So yeah. traditional Little Red Riding Hood, you know, you have Red who mm-hmm. is going through the forest to deliver a basket of stuff to grandma. I mean, it's been portrayed 85 gajillion ways. That's the approximate core of the tale. And then when we get to grandma's house, that's when that's when shit gets a little hanky. Mm-hmm. Hanky with an H, not hanky with a K, but we're getting to that. Hanky and um, KK. Exactly. Because let's talk about the wolf. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about the wolf in the very concept of dressing like grandma, right? So well, first let's first let's look at the uh, look at the old the the folksy aphorism of a wolf in sheep's clothing. That so, that's that's sort of like the that's the text. Yeah. So it's so the the text itself is just really like you know be careful of some of someone who presents themselves in a way that is that is contrary to their actual nature. So that that's the text of it. Yes. But but can we talk about specifically? A wolf really getting down with dressing like grandma. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so I have a couple of thoughts, right? Okay. The first, the first thought is, is it camouflage or is it kink or is it both? And is it, and is it a negative portrayal of someone dressing as a person whose gender they don't normally present? So that's a lot to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I can actually answer all of that for you if you would like. Fuck yeah, you can. Okay. So let's start with the story itself. The story sure. itself, it is camouflage. Anything mm-hmm. else that's trying it's trying to portray, like in terms of like um uh cross sex fantasy, I don't mm-hmm. think is necessarily applicable to sure. the story as it is presented. Sure. Now can you retell this story in a way that's like kink and cross-sex fantasy? You absolutely uh-huh. could. But sure. the, the actual core of it, if you want to just apply it to kink as the story is, uh, mm-hmm. the wolf's ultimate goal is to do harm, right? It's not – nothing about this is consensual. So right. I think that there is sort of like – um maybe a layer of like not even cross sex fantasy, but just like this idea that people could probably use for the kink community. Now I'm talking Mm -hmm. about this with the intention of vilifying kink. Somebody could look at that and say, you don't know what those people are capable of doing. They might seduce you and they Mm -hmm. might come across as people that you know and who you love, but their inner nature is going to destroy you. And if you mention like a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is what mm-hmm. the the story is essentially based on that concept. And yes. like a sheep, what do you usually think of as like a child of light? So like an older woman, a sage yeah. woman, a good hearted Christian woman, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, you know, she, her, her image is being used. Right. To hide and the it, wolf's true nature. So if you, yeah. if you're smart and you yeah. want to vilify non-monogamy and kink, mm-hmm. that is a really good story to use. But can you reclaim this and have a positive spin on it? You absolutely can. See, that would be – that to me would be the interesting piece, right? Trying mm-hmm. to basically take that story and retell it in such a way. Uh, and there's a there's a, uh, another reference to a – a retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. I mean, obviously there have been, like I said before, 1.7 quadrillion uh, retellings of Little Red Riding Hood in all shapes, sizes, colors, and presentations. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's a remake by Catherine Hardwick, and I can't remember what year it came out, but it featured a love triangle of sorts mm-hmm. uh, that not only was uh, was read kind of interested in this kind of sexy woodsman because after all what's more sexy than a dude in flannel who likes to chop wood um girl same yeah exactly right and there's a there's a love triangle between him and red and the werewolf aka the the our our big bad wolf himself oh shut the front door i need to watch this and, and not only that 
but if we want to get a little bit of a little bit of bondage in there, mm-hmm. then all this is happening under the guise of Red being forced to marry somebody. So you've got like a little bit of uh, like, you know, forced marriage, uh, mm-hmm. arranged marriage in there. And Red doesn't want that. She wants the sexy woodsman. But yet there's this dashing werewolf. And and forgive me for bringing up Twilight for just a second. But it's fine. But I mean. There's the whole, I mean, that kind of, there's another sort of love triangle there. We have Edward the Vampire, Mm -hmm. Bella Bella the Mary Sue, and Jacob the Werewolf. And they're all kind of vying for, like, so Jacob and Edward are vying for uh, uh, Bella's affections and attention and such. So, I mean, like, clearly love triangles are one of those things that I, I get really kind of pissed off about. Because most love triangles are basically 99%. Bitch, just date them both and just call it a I day know. and let those dudes get I, over this shit. It is so frustrating. Like, as as somebody who is well-versed in non-monogamous culture, it's yeah. like, this is the easiest problem to solve. <laughs> yeah. And you it's, know what? It, it, it's not that it's a, a Band-Aid, because I don't want people thinking that that's the case but it's like try it yeah try it in the worst case scenario it it clearly doesn't work out and you can you know go off with whoever um actually does the dishes in the house you know if that's what's gonna if, if that's what it takes for you to make that decision that's fine but you know what if all three of you do your house chores and it works and the sex is great like why not make that the first solution? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like like okay, please. Like okay, so you've got you've got one guy who sheds and another mm-hmm. guy who has who has an eating disorder. And like between the two of them, maybe maybe there's maybe each one of them brings a little bit of something different. Like the guy who sheds, maybe he uh Maybe he also is capable of taking care of his own grooming habits. And the guy with the eating disorder, he doesn't have to impose that on anybody. He can just he can work on his own stuff. He can go to he can go to therapy and work on his shit. And but, you know what? If the, if there's two people there to talk with you about it and to like kind of healthfully suggest that hey, if you're having a hard day, this is your protein shake. I'm not going to force you to eat if you don't want to, but I do need you to finish this if you don't do anything else. And here's your vitamins, you know? Exactly. It's it's all about teamwork. And it's it's all about, you know, helping each other live their best lives and heal. Yeah. And like, here's, here's your sunscreen. Make sure you always put your sunscreen on before you go out. Yeah. And you say, and you say to the guy who has a, you know, like a, has a problem with a hirsutism and, and a lot of hair falling out. He's got a little alopecia. Mm-hmm. Then you say here, like, you know, we'll, we'll put some extra drain covers on and we'll uh, and I'll help you with I'll help you brush your hair. Yeah. You know, but but you got a vacuum. Yeah, but you got a vacuum. I yeah. mean, if, if you do one thing today, please don't forget to run the vacuum because, you know, it's your day to run the vacuum. Exactly. So um, I think to sort of go back to your original question about, like. What that story can mean. Like yeah. what, what the story actually means is all about like not not trusting people just because they put on a front. And that historically has been used against people who don't follow cultural mm-hmm. norms. But yeah. can you can you reclaim this? Yes, you absolutely can. Um and I think probably one of the best ways that I've seen it reclaimed is is very sapphic. Ooh. in nature um have you ever seen trick or treat you know what i don't think i have okay um then i actually can't tell you Wait, I, I don't care about spoilers it. but your but your but your audience might my yeah like audience if you haven't seen it um uh th- consider this a spoiler alert <laughs> um insert klaxons here Oh yes, I'm I'm adding that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in Trick or Treat, uh, it, it's a Halloween analogy or uh, sure. not analogy. Um, it is a Halloween story. No, what's the A word? Uh, analysis. No. Uh, Askasm. 
close. Um, so it's not, uh, allegory. No. Anthology. Alopecia. Anthology. There you go. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it it is a anthology that takes place in a small town during mm-hmm. Halloween night, and one of the stories features a very heinous um, character mm-hmm. who um, is disguising himself as a wolf and oh. going after uh, a woman uh, dressed up as Little Red Riding Hood. I see. And the whole story is her and her her girlfriends, you mm-hmm. know, talking about you know getting ready for the big night and Mm -hmm. oh we're so happy that you're going to do it finally and talking about like well i'm really nervous i've never done this before and they're like oh you'll be fine you just have to make sure that you know like you look really slutty so she's like you know little red riding hood and this 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 really awful character who again he's dressed up like a wolf And is going after her. So the implication Mm -hmm. is you, the audience, are led to believe that she's going to fuck somebody at a bonfire that night. Okay. Well, the man attempts to attack her in the wolf suit. She takes him down along with the rest of the girls. And it turns out that all the women are wolves. Now that is awesome. And there, there's like a, a pretty horrific but awesome transformation sequence where all of them turn into the werewolves and just kill this guy. But, but you know, it's like this, it's a collection of women who are all there for each other and who are all seemingly innocent and sexy and fun, mm-hmm. but ultimately going after predatory men. So there is something that's like, even though like it's family, it's also very wow. sapphic and it's very awesome. It's, it is badass. It, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And um, that, that is a way that you can kind of get that non-monogamy and kink and subvert it in that tale. Like, yeah, did they kill people? Absolutely. And that's what the wolf wanted all the time. Mm-hmm. But it was also going against people who wished them harm. So I'm also kind of reminded, like, because you talk about, like, you know, how do you how do you turn the tale of wolf and sheep's clothing on its ear? And the and it's funny that there are there are so many goddamn country folksy aphorisms that you can literally counter one with another, right? Yeah. So the counter to uh, be on the lookout for a wolf in sheep's clothing is you can't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. So the idea of like another so to build off of your idea, and I keep in mind I'm not exactly sure. I'm, actually, I know that there have been a bajillion uh, pop culture references and movies, everything from – that uh, there was a share movie about a boy with elephantiasis. Oh, uh, uh, mask. Mask, exactly. So there's a no, there's an example of a can't judge a book by its cover kind of thing. There've been so many stories about that of like seemingly villainous characters turning out to have hearts of gold. Mm. Uh, there, so I mean, there's I, I feel like that another way to counteract that uh, counteract that kind of villainous tale. And exactly, and what that, that what I'm saying is that what the, the example you just gave mm-hmm. is is an example of don't judge a book by its cover, because yeah. th- this here's a guy thinking that he can go get himself a pretty young thing when in fact uh, he has misjudged fatally the situation. Mm-hmm. So, well, then that actually turns into yet another uh, twist of don't judge a book by its cover into who's hunting who. Yeah. The hunter becoming the hunted. Yeah. So, uh, and again, I do feel bad for spoiling that, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great part of that movie. And it's like, 
part of the reason why it's one of my favorite Halloween films. But, um, yeah, you know, kind of going along with like predatory men uh-huh. and, uh, and, uh, submissive women, you know, there's, there's a lot there's a lot going on there. There, There's a lot more that we can talk about with that, with that particular realm. And it's like, um, when you talk about like, uh, DDLG Mm -hmm. in the community. But I swear to God, it's like, you're reading my mind. It's like, because literally I'm, I'm looking at my notes going, Hmm, yes. Hmm. Segway. Do I smell? And yes. you literally let it right down the path. We're we're gonna go talk a little bit about daddy daughter crap. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where like I'll be honest and admit that this was sort of something that I fell into for a while. Mm-hmm. Not not quite like in the lifestyle sense, but just like as casual sure. play. Sure. And um, like I get the appeal. I'm gonna be the bad yeah. feminist who says I get the appeal. And sure. I don't really care. And it is something that is still fun, but it is so easily abused. And it is really easy for people to get triggered over. So yeah, it's it, like, the, 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 you, you are warned right here that this may be a bit triggering. Uh, just because yeah, I so, know, like, people have had really bad experience with this. But I yeah. think in order to understand why kink and non-monogamy gets vilified so much a lot of it has to do with this concept yeah so so consider consider trigger warnings here uh you know content warning discuss frank discussions of potentially sensitive natures such as uh like incestuous role play and or incestuous behavior within fairy tales uh tropes associated with and discussions of power dynamics that involve people of massive power and persons of lesser power. So spoiler and or uh, uh, content warning all in trigger warning and such. Mm-hmm. It, it is really important to, to talk about that because like in fairy tales as well as in real life, there are so many examples of persons in power abusing those, abusing their power in order to uh, take advantage of those who look up to them in various ways. And there are so many tales, not only like fairy tales, but also real life situations that involve people who uh, are viewed as leaders, who are viewed as uh, persons of high standing. And they take that power and they do all sorts of really, really evil shit with it. And if if we talk fairy tales for a moment, there's there are uh, there are kind of three that I wanted to bring up that all kind of share this. Now, keep in mind, these are three among many. And one of these is a modern fairy tale. So uh, so I'm not talking about just like more like there's a modern retelling of a traditional fairy tale. There's a modern fairy tale. And then there's a really old fairy tale whose name I will fucking just abuse when i put pr- when i try to pronounce it i'm okay. trying to think of it in, in the german but i'm gonna fail um so, so so do you do you want to start with the old one let's do the old one first that's just, a great one just because okay like full full disclosure like before we started recording uh uh parker was just telling me like some of the stuff that he researched and this is one that I had never heard of before, and like we we just need to rip this bandaid off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 prepare prepare thine anus mm-hmm. uh, for as far as I can clear as far as I can tell as far as pronunciation goes, it's uh, a lerlerau. Uh, it's a German slash Austrian fairy tale, uh, you know, tr- kind of traditional Germanic, and it involves a father. Fa- other, a king who has who is pledging to his dying wife that he is not going to marry anyone uh, who is not as beautiful as she. And you can probably see where this is going. It just so ends up the most beautiful woman in the kingdom is 
his daughter. Ew. And and in the traditional fairy tale, the king then goes about working on trying to marry his daughter, and his daughter is not about that life. His daughter is all about like, Dad, can't you just find like somebody else who's your age and not related to and isn't your daughter? And he's like, Nope, nope, got to keep that beauty, got to nail that booty. And uh, so he attempts to woo her, and she basically comes up with a series of tasks like she asked him to host three balls for her and and she asked for these three extravagant dresses a uh, theme to the balls and three extravagant gifts that are also themed to the balls and then she runs the fuck away and she goes and hides someplace but he tracks her down obviously and makes her go to the ball and so she, like and the three dresses there's like a gold dress and a silver dress and a different kind of dress and each one of those dresses has like an associated sort of gift with it, like a golden ring or like a like a thimble or a spindle, like representing, you know, uh, like weaving threads and things. And at, at each ball, what he does, what she does is she try she wears the different she wears the wrong dress to the ball to make herself look different. And she disguises herself and she also takes her gift and puts it in the fucking soup and tries to basically uh insinuate now again this is just my my take on it right uh, i could be i could be misreading the text but but she's trying to basically frame the cooks for cooking the daughter you because know what? So she wants to I, she wants to get I'm out of this just, shit i'm just going to say that um again i have not read this myself but no matter what that's just what i'm going to think because that makes this far more interesting <laughs> so so but for, so for no matter what amusement, uh, so no matter what the story is insinuation absolutely no matter, insinuation is going to be yeah that's text now yep he was hating me <laughs> technically he was, he, technically <laughs> he he was, was licking, licking me. me that's one of my favorite scenes in that whole fucking movie i love that movie so much okay every every single time i watch it i laugh that's it's the best part or no it's not the best part the yep, best part yeah. is, um, oh my God, I can't remember his name. Screaming in the river. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like as soon as I see that, I'm like, yes, this is why I love this movie. Go listen to the go listen to the Happy Ever After podcast where they talk about this movie. It is fucking funny. Uh, the, 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 the podcast is episode. amazing. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, Y'all actually, did such a great job on that. That's how we opened up the season. I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed it because we we sincerely love that movie and um, that's that that's not kink or non-monogamy. That's just straight up vilifying homosexuality. But yeah. Well, no, it's it's more <sighs> it's more sophisticated than that. It's not vilifying it. It's just this is what domination looks like, and if you're reading it as um, homosexual, then you need to really, really think about how you are kind of sensitized to the male gaze. You need That's to sit in the corner and think about what you've done. Yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, uh, so, so how does this God. fairy tale end with this really um, – this cunning daughter trying to convince people that uh, the cook's – cooked her oh it, you know it ends as you would suspect she gets caught and has to get married <laughs> just like to her wah, dad, wah, yes. to her dad. Oh it's my like God. well this it's like well wah, wah. you know what like normally when i'm confronted with um a fairy tale that i haven't heard before i like to do like research and kind of see what the moral of the story is or what the symbolism is and in this case i'm just like fuck this you're not worth my research. <laughs> now, keep in mind there have been retellings of it. Okay. Uh, that are that ha- are a little bit better. Uh, by the way, uh, a lawyer owl is a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. So, uh, for all that pain and suffering, that um, I can see why it isn't as widely known. Right. You know. Um, because, I mean, like, they, they have come up with some really fucked up fairy tales. That might be the worst. Yeah, according to uh, – by the way, for those that, that tend to try to classify fairy tales according to, you know, the Arne Thompson groupings, mm-hmm. it falls under uh, the ATU, like the Arne Thompson Uther grouping 510B 
unnatural love, the dress of gold, of silver, of stars. Those are the three uh, dresses, by the way, gold, silver, and stars. Okay. But the an interesting thing, there have been a gajillion retellings and, re, and adaptations of this, most particularly – I don't know if you're a Robin McKinley fan. Um, uh, it depends on what movie. Uh, Deer Skin. I have never seen it. Oh, it, it's it. Uh, that's her. That's her novel. Uh, oh, it's a. But, oh, oh, it's a. It's a book. Yes, yeah, yeah. Robin McKinley. Uh, in the words of the uh, of Wikipedia, it is a dark fantasy novel by Robin McKinley, and uh, it basically. I, I don't want to give too much away in case you decide to go read some Robin McKinley, who is a a a, a pretty a pretty impressive author in her own right. Uh, she's she has some good stuff. I think Leah's a big fan. Uh, also, one of my favorite authors from growing up, Jane Yolen, uh, did a version of a lawyer. A lawyer, a lawyer. Um, but the uh, the interesting part of it is like here's this here's the adaptation that that Jane Yolen did. The king marries his daughter, who has been emotionally neglected by her father, and misunderstands the king's intentions toward her. The daughter dies in childbirth, like her mother. At the end of the story, suggests the daughter's daughter will suffer the same fate when she comes of age. Thanks, Jane Yolen. <laughs> you can't see my face. <laughs> and it's like. Wah, wah. It's, no, no. It's like, it, have you seen the. Have you seen the compilations of Kamala Harris's face during the vice presidential debate? <laughs> Did you just basically say to me, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. No, it's it's not the <laughs> I'm speaking face, but it's like the like the the shriveled up faces of I want to call you out for lying so bad. And I can't believe that just came out of your mouth face. <laughs> That's the face I am making. Oh, my God. I, I cannot believe that. That someone's like, what can I do to make this story worse? <laughs> how, how can I make this worse? Oh, okay. We're going <sighs> to discuss the consummation and death of the daughter. That's that's what we do. Let's, <laughs> that's that's what we're going to do here. So like <sighs> cy- cycles of abuse, like yeah, that's that's definitely something that comes into play a lot. Even in Once Upon a Time, uh, like cause yeah. I was going to say, like, you you listen to whenever Amanda does the show with me. Like, yeah. th- there's a lot of instances where that happens. And I find it, like, really disturbing that that's, like, like, when you do, like, the whole daddy-daughter thing, mm-hmm. that's definitely part of it. But it hurts really, really bad, too, when, when you realize that this is kind of something that actually happens in real life Mm -hmm. you know so i think that that's just like one more thing that kind of stacks up on the let's vilify the kink community Mm -hmm. so there's you know that's there's another there's another uh retelling that you may not have even thought could happen Mm -hmm. uh and that would be they did a version of this on jim henson's the storyteller well, uh, if anybody, so, <laughs> yeah, right? if anybody, buddy could make this story workable. Um, okay, Jim, lay it so, on me. So, in, in Jim Henson's television series, uh, the storyteller, yes. uh, there's a there's an episode that makes a number of changes. For one, there's a print. The princess is the youngest and most beautiful of the king's three daughters, and is named Sap Sorrow by her cruel sisters. And so rather than like the king wanting to marry her, the marriage has to, is enforced by court as basically saying the king must marry whoever's finger fits into the late queen's ring. And, and it's his youngest daughter. And since she puts it on, she's forced to marry her father against both her and her father's wishes. So, so right that's there, one of those. Right yeah. there off the bat. Uh-huh. Still really messed up, but an improvement. Yeah, so you get the feeling that maybe they're not going to consummate yeah. the, the marriage. Like they're going like, okay, that's that's really weird. I don't want to marry you. You don't want to marry me. You can just go fuck the stable boy, and I'm going to nail me somebody else that's my age. 
and we're just gonna be we're just gonna like be king and queen in appearance are we cool with that yeah i'm cool with that dad okay Please. does that actually happen in the no, in just, I, I, this is you this, this is, is you, me like, this is analyzing the scene yeah this is me applying a head cannon okay so so what happens what what, what does jim what else does jim do different that's it at that's the it. end at the end at the end he marries her and that's that he has the, he has the common sense and the good taste enough to not take the story farther than it needs to go oh damn it jim that's still <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that's still pretty bad yeah, uh, there's uh, is, so there's so many things, so many versions of this. You know what this is like? This is like taming the shrew. Yeah, there was just not a good way to tell the story after a certain point in time. Yeah. So that's why, like, ten things I hate about you just kind of borrows the aesthetic. Yeah, I was literally going to bring that up. Yeah, and yep. it it just does it it just borrows the aesthetic and kind of doesn't tell the story because mm-hmm. of the nature of the story um so i i kind of got something that is kink sure that is n- not necessarily like ddlg but incestuous in nature sure, a, story, away. a story that is all about it, it is kink centric i will Ooh. say but it does the impossible task of Showing villains in kink. Okay. But it is the incestuous monster who is vilified instead. Oh. Do tell. I am, of course, talking about Clive Barker's The Hellbound Heart, which got made into one of my favorite horror films of all time, Hellraiser. Uh Oh. Son of a bitch. So we're we're, we're going to pick through this. Um, Please do, yeah. If if you've never seen Hellraiser, um, congratulations, you are like probably 13 years old, and that's okay. This is or, this or, is or a me learning stone. or you. You've never seen yeah. Hellraiser. Believe it or not, I never have. I've seen a lot of weird movies. I haven't seen Hellraiser, which is not a weird movie. It's a very popular one. It is never an seen incredibly it. popular one. Um, yeah, that's your homework assignment. Um, okay, I gotta go watch Hellraiser. Although, yeah. although I do have a question though. I have uh, so uh, there's somebody that I know who is a total fucking douche canoe mm-hmm. and uh, just idolizes Clive Barker and Hellraiser and like practically lives by uh, and uh, just absorbs the mythos and identifies with it so much. And that had kind of turned me off to it. I, but at the that same is time, totally valid. Uh, I will I will do my best to if not watch it, then at mm-hmm. least read enough synopses so i can build i can build a movie in my head because if, you... if you're going to read anything look for the original book look for the hellbound gotcha. part because gotcha. um like you know clive barker was was part of the production in the the first movie yeah you know so he that that movie is very much just as much him as his book was and there okay. was enough like adaptations and changes to Mm -hmm. like especially the ending is probably the most obvious thing yeah but like the main feeling is still there Mm. and the book there's like a lot more attention to like who the villain is so to speak who the the protagonist is is pretty much Mm -hmm. the villain okay because there's there's two different people that the book focuses on very heavily um, and the movie kind of like takes the one more innocent character, um, yeah. Kirsty, mm-hmm. who, um, she's sort of like the victim of, uh, I- incestuous longing. Nothing necessarily gotcha. happens to her, but, and this really isn't a spoiler in, in sure, part because sure. the movie is so old, but also because, this is just like plot points. It's not like anything major. Sure. But the mythical elements to it, the Cenobites, um, mm-hmm. you know, they they themselves are like, we are not angels, nor are we demons. You know, we're, like we're angels to some, demons to others. We mm-hmm. are neutral. We mm-hmm. will give you the experience of, plain a, uh, of pain and pleasure, indivisible. Mm-hmm. So it's like, 
with interesting Clive, with Clive Barker, you know, being gay, with being very involved in the kink community, mm-hmm. his his mythical beings are saying like kink itself is not inherently bad. It is not inherently sure. evil. It is what you make of it. Right. Like they, these are tools that we're using. And of course, like when they talk about pain and pleasure, you know, they they of course talk about like you know the sexual gratification but like also literally tearing your body apart so it's like you know the stakes are elevated but um and that's where the horror part of it comes in uh but you have somebody who's sort of like escaping the rules if we're Mm -hmm. if we're really doing like a deep dive into the text here Mm -hmm. frank um kirstie's uncle who, yeah. who gets picked up by the Cenobites and essentially is, like, contracted to them. <clears throat> in the text, you can sort of look at this as, like, selling your soul to the devil. But if you're looking okay. at it through the lens of, like, a, a, a queer and kink-centric text, mm-hmm. then you can say, okay, you agree to these boundaries. Mm-hmm. And by escaping you know, the realm of where the Cenobites are, you are breaking those boundaries. And that's when he becomes, you know, really controlling and demanding and um, convinces somebody to kill for him and Mm. is like really trying to escape that realm and come back to the land of the living. And it's like the, the way that he's doing that though is through manipulation and threats. So it's like, yes, again, The realm of kink is neutral. It is what you make of it. And if you abuse that, you are the villain. The dressed up Cenobite, like Pinhead, you Mm -hmm. think that he is the villain? He is not a villain. Mm. He's the moderator. Interesting. You know? And it's this kind of... The abuse of power is what's villainous. And in the book and in the movie, like Frank is bad, but the person yeah. who he accom- his accomplice in it is mm-hmm. just as evil and is just as domineering, but is also a victim of Frank. Well, and that really that kind of ties into some experiences I'm familiar with in that a person can be both abuser and abused. Yeah. So there's. And- there's one person who fits that category. There's another person who just fits like the abuser category and is trying to like find an easy way out. Yeah. You see, when you when you present it in that fashion, the the text and the movie become a hell of a lot more interesting to me because mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so I've seen horror movies, right? And, I, and mm-hmm. I'm familiar with with horrific concepts. I mean, to kind of tie it all to the loop of the of the podcast, I'm very mm-hmm. familiar with it with the idea of horrific elements of fairy tale telling, because yes. often fairy tales will have a horrific element to them, you know, in order to teach a lesson, in order to provide some spice. In order mm-hmm. to make it like titillating and interesting for the for the consumer, mm-hmm. but I, I never really would go out and just want to consume horror for the sake of like graphic uh, titillation. I, I'm very no. much more interested in the psychological elements therein. It's one of the reasons why I love true crime stuff. Why I love yeah. storytelling. Yeah, and I I think. This is interesting. I had somebody the other day get into a conversation about um, how there's a lot of things in horror films, Mm -hmm. like they were specifically talking about the media, uh, not necessarily the storytelling element, that are ableist. And I Mm. half agree, only Mm. half, like in the sense that like you're making people afraid of like mental disorders, like psychoses and people with mental disorders and like yeah. certain imagery of like you know god forbid you ever lose your legs or something like that mm. yeah can that be read as ableist yes but you have to understand too that horror is a very safe way to express your fears and yeah. i think that even if you are somebody who takes your mental health for granted to express fear of not having the same ableism 
mentally or physically. I think that is valid. And I think that to just sort of like dismiss a lot of movies as being ableist is sort of missing the point of horror as a genre. Yeah. And same thing with like um, abuse and like horror sort of being like the highlight of those situations, but under more extreme circumstances. Like, um, what was it? Uh, P when it chapter two came out yeah uh this is this is where you could tell who read the book and who didn't right (laughs) where um people were having a really big issue with the beginning of it chapter two and i was like that is where the book starts like Mm -hmm. yeah like very graphic depictions of homophobic actions and slurs and a willingness Mm -hmm. to kill somebody yeah that's not the movie endorsing it. It is the movie vilifying the town. And like, mm-hmm. can you be triggered over it? Absolutely. And like, is it something yeah. that I'm saying like you have to watch and endure? No, no, you don't. But yeah. it, to dismiss it as just being something that bothers you and is uh, homophobic, that misses the point of what's going on you know yeah you 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 don't have to consume media that bothers you but don't dismiss it outright just because it bothers you yeah there's there's a certain thing to be said for i mean obviously you don't you don't want to consume anything that's going to be triggering and cause you ill mental health but Mm -hmm. at the same time uh, i feel like i'm just kind of repeating what you're saying in a slightly different way you can't just dismiss it so no you can't um so I think God that's that, that that is sort of it as far <laughs> as as I can go. Um yeah. but um I'd be interested to like hear your reaction to uh watching Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah. If you've never I, seen I will, it before. So so I will take this as homework to do my best to consume some either was it Hell Something Heart? What's the name of the book again? The Hellbound Heart. Hellbound hell- is one word. Gotcha. So the Hellbound Heart or Hellraiser, the movie itself, I will mm-hmm. do my best to consume that at some point in the not terribly far future so that we can discuss it at greater depth. Honestly, I just as a fun Halloween read, anything mm-hmm. by Clive Barker will kind of scratch that itch. Gotcha. Uh, he He's a very he's a very lucid writer like his gotcha. his writing is very palpable. So I think mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's also why he makes a very brilliant horror writer. Yeah. I mean, so and, uh, you know, take that for what you will. Absolutely. I mean, and honestly, you know, one of my favorite King books is not anything that's it's a major piece of his. It's actually uh, Eyes of the Dragon, which I, which in and of oh, itself is a fairy oh. tale. Yes. Uh, I only read the first chapter of it. Oh, it's so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I, I just I just remember the dick joke. That's the only <laughs> thing I can remember about it. In the first chapter, there is a dick joke. That's so funny. That's oh, my it. God. The the thing about Eyes of the Dragon is that it, uh, and without saying too much, but I think it becomes fairly clear fairly early that this is a continuation of his, of his universe that exists throughout all of yeah. his books. Yeah. And... That's one thing that I love about him and uh, another author, us uh, author named Simon Green, Simon R. Green, mm-hmm. who uh, uh, wrote has written I think probably a half a dozen different series. Is and he's an incredibly prolific author. I mean that motherfucker just churns out book after book after book after book across like I don't know five different series. And oh, wow. all and all those series is are linked Hmm. so they're all they all share a common universe that are connected uh through a nebulous sort of uh kind of like shadow universe and so it's it's very similar to how king does it in the fact like if you think about you know the the dark tower series as being kind of the, the nexus universe around which all the rest of his books sort of revolve. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Simon R. Green's 
on night i think it's a night side i I can't quite remember the the name of the series that that has the mystical universe in it but there's this sort of nexus place that that different that has existed throughout time and his characters will often meet each other from different walks and different times of life and they're all still connected via the night side and sometimes Mm -hmm. they inadvertently time travel and end up a few hundred years in the future into his space opera series or might end up like a few hundred years into the past, into his kind of like fantasy esque series, but they're all still connected via the night side. Interesting. And then there's there's like a modern uh, kind of humorous uh, pulp fiction detective series that that is in the night side itself. And then there's the the psychic uh, there's the psychic group that uses the powers of brain stuffs in order to uh do things and then there are the then there's the stories of the druids who are this family that actually technically runs the world through their magical abilities and uh then the druid series are all named after like the book named after various james bond books and just iterations of those (laughs) so it's just really kind of funny stuff but like there's a lot of humor in his work but so that that's a main difference between him and King, right? I mean, King's humor yeah. is is dark when it's there, but uh, it's it's uh, weird because it's like it is dark when it's there, but he also he has a very childlike sense of humor, you know, and it doesn't mm-hmm. pop out all the time. It's like uh, I think one of like the biggest turning points for me, like trying to understand who Stephen King is. Um, yeah. was Maximum Overdrive. Oh, wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. Who, who is Stephen King as a person, and how can I relate it to his work? If you watch Maximum Overdrive, you <laughs> suddenly realize just how goddamn goofy he is. He is a truck. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> I am a truck. I drive fast. <laughs> <laughs> I am a truck. Oh my god. So oh, damn it. uh like in 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 conclusion like yeah. I think I think that there there is going to eventually be more of a turning point yeah. with not coding kink and non-monogamy as yeah. villainous. I think we are starting to see that and it's been done in the past but yeah. you know I it's 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 up there with um queer coding villains, you know. Yeah. It's just going to take a really long time to not use those tropes anymore. Yeah, it's so e- it's so easy to just fall back on the old standards, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if, if like we like if you know the bad make the bad guy make him queer, you know, Basically. just like a, a that their queer guy he's, he ain't right. He, yeah. He's a little queer in the head. I mean. Yeah. Forgive the dear, dear, dear accent there, but I mean, I grew up in rural Ohio, and uh, so I kind of, I, I kind of like grew up in that life. And yeah. as, as somebody who started off as someone who was significantly more religiously conservative than I am now, uh, it's it, it has been an eye-opening experience, kind of growing through the experiences of my youth and seeing that the world was larger than a uh, a two and a half mile oval, if you understand my my rough NASCAR reference. Um, I, I do now. <laughs> but uh, the, my point, though, is that the, the the world is bigger than than some people are ever led to believe or can believe, and it is so incredibly important to acknowledge that there are people outside of our own existence, mm-hmm. and just because outside of our own existence does not mean that they're bad. Uh, just because yeah. someone, just because like a dude sucks another dude's dick does not make him an automatically bad person or an effeminate person. And and, and we could go, we could make 17 other podcasts about how effeminate coding of, of masculine presenting men is deemed as negative. We could talk for hours about that. Yes. And it's like, I I don't know how to tell you this politely, but like, you can suck on another man's clitoris too. And you're fine. And that's, that, that, 
that is an eye-opening experience, and I highly recommend doing it. Early and often, just like voting. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Parker, thank you so much for joining me. And Absolutely. The, the, this was fun. I'd love to have you back on for something. And, sure. Um, you, do you want to do the sign-off with me? Uh, sure. So does that mean that you do, now you do the starting one, right? I think yes, that's I how do. it works. Uh-huh. Okay, I got it. Right, yeah, yeah. It may not be the end. It may not be happy. But you are always welcome to this party. Take care. Peace out. And.